Amid rising tensions and political turmoil, the Grumman F-14 Tomcat emerged just in time to prevent Soviet fighters from outclassing U.S. seaborne warplanes that were struggling to keep up with the MiG fighters being produced at impressive rates. With its supersonic speeds, sleek profile, and innovative variable geometry wings, the mighty Tomcat came to shake the world of combat aviation to its core, stop the Soviet aims at air superiority, and bring a blanket of protection over the U.S. carrier fleet. In the hands of U.S. Navy pilots, the aircraft would become the scourge of the Libyan Air Force and would bring Muammar Gaddafi's regime to its knees while attempting to claim the Gulf of Sidra. But it would be in the hands of Iranian pilots where the aircraft would showcase its most extensive and spectacular combat operations. Nevertheless, when Iraq became an enemy of the United States, the American authorities would stop at nothing to destroy every Tomcat they could get a hand on and prevent the hostile regime from using their own incredible weapon against them. One plane to rule them all. At the height of the Vietnam War, the U.S. military found itself in a severe predicament. Its warplanes were struggling against an ever-evolving fleet of Soviet fighters. If nothing was done about it, they would soon outperform the American warplanes on the battlefield. The situation wasn't any better at sea, as the latest developments in Soviet cruise missiles posed a massive threat to the U.S. carrier fleets. As such, the Air Force and the Navy were looking for new, capable aircraft that could face a new generation of modern warfare. A fast and powerful warplane capable of outclassing the MiGs was needed, while a light, maneuverable aircraft that could intercept incoming enemy missiles was required at sea. With such colossal challenges afoot and a finite number of resources on stock, the recently appointed Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, made a highly unorthodox and controversial suggestion to develop one single plane for both branches. The program was named Tactical Fighter Experimental, or TFX, and despite considerable pushback from the U.S. Navy, McNamara had his way. The result was the Grumman F-111, a formidable aircraft that ticked every box on the Air Force's and Navy's lists. When the testing phase began, it was clear that the novel aircraft served the Air Force's requirements better than the Navy's. The F-111 was adapted for carrier operation, and the result was a fast, powerful, and agile platform that could easily outperform most of the hostile aircraft that it would encounter over the Vietnamese battlefields. However, it was a heavy and cumbersome fighter with a less-than-ideal performance at slow speeds, severely affecting takeoff and landing in the confined space of an aircraft carrier's flight deck. After several disastrous accidents, where many test pilots lost their lives trying to land the modified F-111B on a U.S. carrier, the Department of Defense finally abandoned the idea of a joint fighter solution. Consequently, it approved the development of an entirely new aircraft that would be finally honed for naval fleet defense. A Unique Proposal The Navy immediately released a request for proposal for a new seaborne fighter interceptor capable of supersonic speed and light and maneuverable enough to operate from aircraft carriers. Several manufacturers participated in the intense competition, but Grumman's model immediately caught the attention of the Navy. The design was ambitious, yet highly thought out and efficient. It had all the characteristics that had made the F-111 so impressive for air combat and interception with the addition of a set of variable geometry wings. Such wings could be swept back during high-altitude flight to achieve supersonic speeds of up to 1,600 miles per hour relatively quickly. At the same time, the wings could be arranged in a forward position for superior low-speed stability and the ability to land on carriers without significant issues. Moreover, the versatile wing configuration allowed the new aircraft to occupy less space on the carrier when its wings were folded back, and while in the air, it benefited from all the advantages of a platform with a larger wingspan. To make the most of the variable geometry wing configuration, the aircraft was equipped with two formidable Pratt & Whitney TF-30 engines, the same powerhouses used for the F-111. The engine alone gave the new platform an undisputable advantage over any Soviet aircraft, as the technology was vastly superior to anything the enemy was using at the time. 
Besides the futuristic wing design and the potent dual-engine configuration, the Grumman proposal had a third significant feature specially concocted to make the warplane the ultimate seaborne fighter. A state-of-the-art radar system capable of targeting six objectives at a time, tracking an additional 18, and even detecting and engaging incoming cruise missiles. As if that wasn't enough, the aircraft was also one of the first to be equipped with a fighter-to-fighter -fighter data link, which allowed pilots to share targeting information in real time, a pioneering technology that would pave the way for future electronic warfare. Regarding armament, the new fighter was equipped with two AIM-54 Phoenix missiles, capable of engaging targets up to 115 miles away. The platform was also armed with three AIM-7 Sparrow missiles for mid-range targets, and for short-range encounters in dogfights, it would use its M61 Vulcan cannon. In 1974, the formidable new design officially entered service and was named Tomcat, after Admiral Thomas F. Connolly. Chaos in the Gulf of Sidra Gradually, the Tomcat became a vital asset for most U.S. carrier-based operations worldwide and played a crucial role during the last days of the war in Vietnam, Operation Desert Storm, the Bosnia Conflict, the Kosovo War, and eventually in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. However, one of its most impressive performances happened during its combat debut in the summer of 1981. Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi had suddenly claimed possession of the Gulf of Sidra and declared an air exclusion zone. The move shocked Europe, as the Gulf was considered vital for all trade across the Mediterranean region. With Russia's support, Libya prohibited any traffic through the Gulf and threatened to destroy any European vessel or aircraft passing through what he considered its territory. The US and its allies quickly responded and decided to force Libya to enforce its air exclusion zone, confident that the defiant nation would back down before risking an all-out war with the United States. Amid rising tensions after the U.S. taunted Libya with a massive display of force the day before, Gaddafi unleashed two Su-22s in hot pursuit of a single S-3A Viking sent across the contested region on a scouting mission. The Viking fled and dove to low altitude, trying to lose the pursuers. At the same time, an E-2C Hawkeye identified the position of the Su-22 and relayed the information to two American Tomcats. With afterburners roaring and flying at full speed, the two F-14s intercepted the enemy aircraft as they continued to scour for the Viking. When the opposing warplanes met, the American pilots signaled the Libyan counterparts to turn back. But in a defiant move, they refused. Then the unthinkable happened. One of the Su-22s fired a missile against one of the Tomcats, but the high maneuverability of the craft, as well as its pilot's excellent training, allowed it to dodge the projectile at the last second. It was now the Tomcat's turn to play. In a display of overwhelming agility, the Tomcat recovered from its dive and flung back at a hard 180-degree maneuver to emerge behind the Libyan warplanes. By then, the other Tomcat was also in position, and with a quick burst of fire, one Su-22 plummeted into the water, forcing the pilot to eject. The other enemy pilot tried to flee, while the American airmen asked for permission to fire upon the other jet. Soon, the remaining Su-22 was shredded by the Tomcat's fire. Libya would attempt to exercise control of its no-flying zone on several more occasions, but the mighty Tomcat was always there to deny every attempt and send Soviet-made aircraft to the bottom of the sea. From friend to enemy, as impressive as the Tomcat's combat history was when flown under the U.S. flag, the aircraft would truly showcase its combat superiority over Soviet fighters when flown by Iranian pilots. In the 1970s, Iran sealed a significantly advantageous deal by acquiring 80 F-14 Tomcats, becoming the first and only nation outside the United States to access the formidable combat aviation technology. The warplanes came at a considerable price, and the deal is credited with saving the Tomcat's continuous development, which was facing financial troubles at the time. The U.S. ally in the Middle East suddenly had one of the most advanced air forces in the region. But the tables were violently flipped in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution and the Shah's deposition, which left an Islamic regime in his place. 
the Iranians were forced to learn to use what was arguably the most advanced fighter in the world without the help of the country that made it. Against all odds, they successfully learned to operate the aircraft and its Phoenix missiles. When the Iran-Iraq war erupted in 1980, the Tomcats were one of the main advantages for the Iranian Islamic Republic. The Iraqi invasion was brutal, and the Iranians struggled to contain their advances on the ground. However, they quickly established decisive superiority in the air. During the next eight years of conflict, the Iranians would be able to push the Tomcat farther than America had been able to. It became a frequent occurrence that a single F-14 would take down an entire Iraqi squadron. In addition, the long range of the Phoenix missiles gave the Iranians a considerable advantage as they often could shoot down incoming hostile warplanes before they could target their own platforms. Later, when the Iraqis adopted newer MiG-25 fighters equipped with long-range missiles, the skies over Iran became the backdrop to some of the most spectacular air battles in modern history. Unsustainable. In 1981, Two Tomcats engaged and hit two MiG-25s from over 60 miles, damaging one of the Iraqi planes and taking out the other. Three years later, a single Tomcat ambushed four Iraqi fighters, downing three while the last one managed to escape. Iran claims to have only lost four planes to enemy engagements during the eight-year war and boasted 130 downed Iraqi warplanes. Nevertheless, by 1988, the fleet of 80 Iranian Tomcats had been reduced to 25 working platforms, as the rest would have to be cannibalized for spare parts. As Iran grew increasingly desperate for F-14 parts, the U.S. prioritized destroying any surviving Tomcats after the aircraft was officially replaced by the F-18 in 2006. Preventing the Islamic nation from using U.S. technology against them or their allies became a top priority, and parts of the iconic warplane were accounted for, hunted down, and destroyed in a fierce attempt to hinder Iran's ability to continue to use the American fighter. Iran claims to have 24 Tomcats still in active service, but the numbers are severely questioned by U.S. authorities, who put the number much closer to 15 airframes, and are confident the Tomcat will stop being sustainable for Iran in the following years. Thank you for watching Dark Skies. For more incredible warplanes and the world-defining operations they helped accomplish, check out our other Dark Documentaries channels where we explore more fascinating military stories. Also, don't forget to hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.